It's time to come out of the matrix. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great Oz has spoken. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to do. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. Welcome, everyone, to Beyond the Matrix, Jewish Answers for Life and Faith. I'm your host, Ira Michelson, along with my co-host, Rod Bryant. If you're listening right now, it's because you made the decision to unplug and join the real world. Look, you're not going to find anyone controlling things from behind the curtain here. No need to click your heels three times. Just make the choice between the blissful ignorance of illusion or embrace the sometimes painful truth of reality. We have an exciting show for you today, so get strapped in as we go Beyond the Matrix. Welcome, everyone, to Beyond the Matrix. It is live today. We're not doing any silly intros. I am so excited I could spit. I don't know about you guys. I, I'm, I'm breathless and almost not able to do the rest of the show. I'm hyperventilating. And Rabbi Singer has made it in from the great holy land of Israel. Rabbi Singer, how are you feeling? Well, I certainly am not in a spitting mood. I am... Uh... I wasn't happy to land in the United States, but spitting is too far. It's a figure so of it's, speech. It's over the top. But it's a figure of speech. I never heard this. This is the first. What? So excited I could spit? Yeah, I never heard this. I, I never heard that either. So uh, I yeah, I'm, I'm from Brooklyn. Brooklyn. So, yeah. I'm from Brooklyn. It doesn't take much to see people walking down the street. Well, what what am I from? Alabama? Where? What do you think? This, uh, <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> you're from Brooklyn. <laughs> you're from Borough Park. Don't start in Brooklyn, <laughs> you're from Borough Park. That's a different land. It's a different uh, country completely. You need to have a passport to go into Borough Park. They check your uh, your credentials. Your, your where, where, where they, is check your your they check your lineage before you can get into that. <laughs> Did you know that my – actually, I used to spend a lot of time there on 13th Avenue. My grandparents lived in Borough Park, and my father grew up there, as a matter of fact. Hmm. So there. There you go. Um, anyway, so uh, it's a figure of speech, and why I'm so excited is because of the text that we're going into today. Um, we're going to be going into Yeshiahu to Isaiah chapter 7 through chapter 11. And we're going to probably deal with those chapters in a little bit different way than I think what people are expecting. Yes, get your Bibles open and ready to rumble. So, yeah. so Rabbi, why don't you take us, uh, start us off in chapter 7. But um, we were chatting before the show started about chapter 8 and chapter 10 and maybe talking a little bit about the names. But why don't you set us up with Isaiah 7 and where, where we're going to be going today? Well, you know, the first to set up for the book of Isaiah, I remember a number of years ago I was speaking in England. There was a, a Limud conference, and it's their major international event. And uh, I think I, I had, let's say, three or four presentations there, but there were many other speakers, uh, scholars around the world, and uh, professors of of the Bible from from the United Kingdom. So I thought, well, so I, you're not speaking constantly over the course of a few days. So when you're not speaking, of course, as, as one of the speakers, you, you have the choice to attend another speaker. So I, I thought, you know what, there's this woman who's a professor at uh, Manchester of on the Bible, and she was giving a presentation on the book of Isaiah. And I thought, you know what, why not? So... <laughs> <laughs> so I I, uh, I went in, sat down to her, and she saw me. She had attended one of my programs, and she kind of blushed a little bit, and she began her presentation. She's a Ph.D. In, in, in Bible and so on and so forth. And one of the things she said at the outset is that the book of Isaiah is essentially, although it is regarded um, in terms of biblical literature as the most um, basically the most exquisite piece of biblical literature in you know in, in throughout the Jewish scriptures it is a mess that's the word she used it's a mess and that's true incidentally superficially of Isaiah uh, Ezekiel Jeremiah superficially these books are not structured in any order as we would find in in in, in Samuel and Kings Joshua and Judges where there's this, a narrative that flows through it reads as a very gripping sometimes very troubling story uh, but what she saw as a mess is really is really 
not a cacophony of noises, but rather a harmony of, of exquisite music. And that's what, is, what was missing from her understanding of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 7 through 11 brings into view something really quite marvelous. Um, you wanted to talk about the names. We have there two, of, we have two events that occur. Isaiah 7 is, of course, very famous. So is Isaiah chapter 9, because both of them are used by the church. Both of these chapters are used by the church in order to advance a Christological teaching. One of them is Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7 is describing an event in history. It's the Syrio-Ephraimite War. It took place some 2,700 years ago. And uh, here we find uh, that there's an alliance. Syria, not us Syria, but Syria, along with the northern kingdom. At this juncture in Jewish history, after the death of Solomon, the Jewish people had divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom, called the kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom, that of Judah. Well, that split, sometimes it was a civil war, and this is one of those punctuated moments where the northern kingdom of Israel have allied themselves with Syria. Why? Because they were annoyed at Judah, the king of Judah at that time is Ahaz, who had an alliance with the, As the Assyrian Empire. That was mm -hmm. very troubling to them. Right. And that's what comes into view as we look at Isaiah chapter 7. You wanted to look at names? Is that something well, you wanted to Well, yeah, and then we see that in, in 7. And the reason why I do that is because this is an issue that comes up quite frequently where we see people discussing um, names. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that they need to understand from a Hebrew perspective what the construct of names are and, and, and the significance of names. And I think it's important, certainly, because we see this in this in these chapters um, that um, very clearly um, we see the names of uh, Isaiah's sons spoken of. We see uh, the first one right in verse three. Uh, after you set up this whole idea in verse two, it talks about Ephraim, you know, the northern kingdom aligning themselves, as you said. And then we see in verse 3 um, that Hashem says to Isaiah to go out with your son, Sher Yeshuv, to meet Achaz at the end of this uh, conduit of the upper pool by the road of the Fuller's Field. And I think right. it's interesting that when you see that, Sher Yeshuv um, ties in with, with um, and I think we talked about this on another show um, when we talked about Isaiah. Um, and the idea of chapter 8, verse 18, that I think clears up some of these things. Right. So what comes into view is something very critical. Uh, as I, as I, we, we have spoken about in the past, there is nothing extra in the Jewish scriptures. Absolutely it does not. look like a mess if you have no intimacy with it. I remember diving the first time. I was in St. Thomas, the first time I ever plunged into the, into the ocean in the Caribbean Sea and seeing just a mess of fish. That's what it looked like, just a lot of fish. But in fact, as I began to study them, each one had such unique features. I remember the first time I'd ever looked into a body, a, a torso of a person. It looked just like a mess of of bloody organs, but in fact, every part of it had a purpose. It's precisely the same way with Isaiah. We know what, what's what been said is accurate because the irony is Shar Yashuv, this child who we're introduced to, they'll just understand what's happening. Uh, the southern kingdom, Judah, is surrounded by two enemies, surrounded by Syria, it's obviously the Syria, Damascus, and surrounded by the northern kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom, Judah, is an enormous amount of trouble, and Isaiah comes with his older son, Shar Yashuv. Now, this child will never be mentioned in the Bible again. So this is very strange. As you mentioned, this is in 7.3. Why is it there? Because the name of this child, Shar Yashuv, means the remnant will remain. Right. As you also alluded to a moment ago, in the Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18, Isaiah is going to explain to us why these names are important. The children themselves are not critical in and of themselves, their names. What is very important is these names are signs in Isaiah 8, verse 18. These signs that have given, behold, I and the children whom the Lord have given to me will be for what? Not just for our family, no, for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells mm -hmm. in Mount Zion. So therefore we have Shariyashiv is going to be introduced to us in 
seven three. That means when Isaiah comes down to the washer's field, it's a very strange scene. Ahaz is the king of Judah. He's in enormous trouble. He hears the prophet is coming, Isaiah. He's embarrassed. He was a wicked king. He hides where? In a place really kings didn't go, where people wash their clothing. And Isaiah is directed to go there with his son. And he shows up with his son, and almost certainly his wife is there, because we're going to see how Isaiah is pointing to the young woman. So he shows up with Shayashiv, bang! Shayashiv never comes up again in the Bible. So we see he's there not because of any other reason, but because he's a portent for the future. Uh, incidentally, there's another king in the north. His name is Hosea. At the exact same moment, they are contemporaries, live at the same time. Hosea in the north, he too is going to have a wife. As we'll see in a moment, Isaiah's wife right. is a prophetess. She's a holy woman. Hosea's wife is a prostitute. Isaiah's children are portents to God saving the southern kingdom. Hosea's children, I will not have pity on you. You are not my you're not my children. Um, you will not be seated. Those children are portents to the destruction of the southern kingdom. Do you see how delicious that is? Mm -hmm. How each one just how each one is against the other. We have two prophets. They were contemporaries of each other. Technically, Hosea was a little bit an older man than Isaiah. The book of Hosea is slightly older than Isaiah, technically, right. but they lived at the same time. They both have wives. One is a prostitute. One is a prophet. Both have children. The one's children's names are an indication, a portent of doom to the northern kingdom, because that's what Hosea's primary audience is, the northern kingdom. Isaiah has children, and those, the names given to those children, assigned by God, are portents for restoration. They will remain. Nothing can happen to them. In fact, those who come against them will be destroyed. Get right. how, how right. beautiful that is? Yeah, and, and, is. and, and so delicious, as you like to say, it is. That, it's that, crazy. that uh, although we don't see it used as a proper name anywhere else in the Hebrew Scriptures, just in a few chapters further in these chapters that we want to deal with today, we see starting in verse 20 of Isaiah chapter 10, um, um, that it starts off first. It says, bayom hahu lo yosif od sha'al Yisrael, this idea of a remnant of Israel. Thanks. Setting up what you're talking about. And then the beauty is in the very next two verses in 21, uh, 10, 21, it starts off, Sha'ar Yeshuv, Sha'ar yeah. Yaakov El, El, El Gibor. Ki im yeye amcha Yisrael kechol haya Sha'ar Yeshuv, bo kilayon harutz shotef tzedaka. Okay, and it's talking about only a remnant shall return, only a remnant of Yaakov to the mighty God. Even if your people, O Israel, should be as the sands of the sea, only a remnant of it shall return. Destruct destruction is decreed, retribution comes like a flood. So mm -hmm. we see that even though we don't see it as a proper name, there's a reason why uh, Isaiah says what he says in 818, that these are signs and portents or signs and wonders. There's a reason why his son is called Sha'ar Yeshuv, as you said, Rabbi, and there it is in black and white in 1021 and 1022. The idea that Hashem, God says, this is what will happen in that day. There will be a Sha'ar Yeshuv. There will be a remnant that returns. Right. Beautiful. So I hope the listeners understand. You know, the Talmud says in Tractate Brachot on 7b that... Um, in the beginning of life, all we have, all we're given is, is a name. That's how we begin our life. And the end of our lives, when we, after 120 years, all we take with us is a good name. That applies to an individual. But these children are going to be very unique in that they're a signpost, not just for an individual, but for the corporate Israel or the, the nation whom they represent. Again, we're now in a period of time with the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, the children of Jacob, are divided into two nations, in the north and the south. In our tour in Israel, we're going to see all this. We're going to actually see these chapters before our eyes. I'll mention that, you know, we'll mention that as we go along. But yes, um, the northern kingdom is going, to, uh, is going to follow the names attributed to these children. Now, in Hosea 2... There's a promise that, in fact, it, they're going to return. That means it's going to be okay. So that's Hosea 2. Paul is going to misappropriate that, which means this is 
terrible. But what happens in Hosea 2, just as important to know this, why not? In Hosea 2, after he gets smacked in the face, it says that those who are not my people will be called my people, which means right. ultimately God is going to allow the northern kingdom to be restored. We see that in Ezekiel 37. The two rods will become one, which means the, it will be undone. And what Paul is going to do is misappropriate that and say, no, this is referring to the Gentiles. It isn't. Um, that is, uh, unfortunately, that has led so many people who are in the church astray. Uh, uh, that's a, a blatant misuse of the text. Absolutely. So we understand what's happening here. So now, now, since we're on the subject, maybe we can go into 8.3 and you can discuss Maharshalal Shalal Chashbaz. Right. You know. So this is, this is a, a very important point, which is frequently misunderstood. Uh, uh, the, the child, you have to look very carefully at the words here, and people go, well, well, what do you mean? Well, listen very carefully, because they go, who is this child? Now, the child has a very strange name, and you, and you go, it's strange because it sounds funny. Mm -hmm. Well, it does funny. The name of the child is Maher Shalal, Shalal Hashbaz, Hashbaz. Right. Mm -hmm. Which basically means hasten the loot, quicken the booty. Mm -hmm. the, now you're going, well, that's a long name. That's not why it's strange. <laughs> the reason it's strange is it's redundant. They basically mean the same thing, hasten loot. What that means is there are two uh, kingdoms, that is Syria and, and that with Damascus and the northern kingdom of Israel, and they're going to be destroyed. So that name indicates that. But look carefully at Isaiah and look, who is the one who is to be given, who is given the mandate to assign that name to this child that's coming. If we look very carefully, you'll see there, look, look at the name very carefully. Wh whose name is, who is supposed to give it that name? The, said to, look at verse 3. I went to the prophetess, which means that they were intimate together. She conceived she bore a son. This is verse 3 of chapter 8. And mm -hmm. the Lord said to me, that means the Lord said to Isaiah, call his name Maher Shal Hashbaaz. Mishalal Hashbaaz. So Isaiah is given a mandate to give this child the name. The father is given them to give this name, which is indicative of the destruction of the two enemies of Ahaz. If you go back to the very famous Isaiah 714, it's made famous because, again, it's misappropriated by Matthew in the New Testament. In Isaiah 7.14, um, we have there, Behold, the Lord, behold, Lord will give you a sign. Behold, the young woman is with a child, the karos shemo. The meaning of those words is, and she will call. So this is very delicious. The, in Isaiah 7.14, who is to call, name the child Emmanuel? The mother. Right. The word of the caress means, and she will call. There is something, and so therefore the mother is told to give the child the name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God is with, with God. us. That means that, God, that Hashem, and we're going to see that name coming up, not as a name, but as a concept coming up in Isaiah 8, that, that God is with the southern kingdom. So that's what she's to call, and Isaiah is to give the name to point to the destruction of, of the northern kingdom of Israel and, uh, and Syria. You see what's happening here? And that's why this, this, this pronoun is critical. This is incidentally going to spell enormous trouble for the church because when Matthew, when Matthew 123 is going, to, is going to quote this, we know that, of course, um, there is in no place does, is Mary call Jesus Emmanuel. That never happens. Mm -hmm. No one calls Jesus Emmanuel. In fact, in Luke, very quite directly, she is told in Luke one thirty. she is told the angel in what's called the, um, the infancy narrative. In Luke, it's very, very elaborate. The infancy narrative in Luke is longer than some books in the New Testament. You have there that the angel who is encountering Mary is told, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And you'll conceive in your womb and bring forth, and you shall call his name Jesus. It's very right. interesting. So Luke, Luke, by the way, does not know about Matthew. People think, well, why didn't Luke get on the phone? Hey, Matthew, what did you put in there? They weren't talking to each other. <laughs> they, they didn't have <laughs> we email. We don't know who they were. <laughs> right. I couldn't think of, their infancy narratives are very, very, so different that they actually have, they're, 
there, except for the fact that Mary born of vir- that Jesus born a virgin in 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 Bethlehem. That's all they have in common. They have nothing else in common. So, but Luke therefore has no clue that Matthew is going to be pulling this. Matthew is going to have to change this, and therefore people are very familiar with Matthew will change the young woman to behold a virgin. What they don't notice is if you look carefully at Matthew one twenty three, Matthew has to change the pronoun here. And if you look at Matthew one twenty three, it doesn't say the chorus and she will call, but it says and they will call. Look at that carefully. They will call. Which if the chorus doesn't mean they will call, it means she will call. Why does Matthew change it? Because in fact she never is calling Jesus Emmanuel. And therefore who are they? We have no idea. They just become you know, some anonymous thing. So there's so much going on in these texts, and there's so much going on in how these texts have to be stripped by the writers of the Christian uh, canon. We don't know who they are. They're anonymously written. Absolutely. And then then in the same way that we talked about the name uh, in chapter 10, uh, Shar Yeshuv, we see in chapter 10 again related to that name, Meher Shalal Chashbaz, um, in Isaiah ten six, um, it's interesting what it says there. In the Hebrew, it says, "Begoy chaneif ashalchenu v'al am evrati atzavenu lishlol shalal v'lavoz baz." Okay, right. so it's it's bringing in that same idea, and it says what in verse 5 it's interesting because it starts off in verse 5 and it says Assyria rod of my anger in whose hand as a staff is my fury he says what I send him against an ungodly nation I charge him against the people that provokes me to do what to take its spoil and to seize its booty Mm -hmm. there it is the explanation of the sign and wonder uh, that is the the name of one of Isaiah's sons right so so now we have a better understanding and it's again very important when we have Hosea, Hosea doesn't mention Isaiah. Isaiah doesn't mention Hosea, right? They're, they're contemporaries. Micah's a contemporary as well. They're not mentioning each other. There are prophets who do, but they don't. They're not, they're not given that mandate to do that. It's not relevant. Ezekiel is going to be mentioning Daniel three times, but that's, that's a whole different deal of why Ezekiel is going to be doing that. They're not interested in doing that, but they're very important because remember what we talked about this horizontal reading. We want to we want to contrast Hosea's wife, Gomer, a prostitute. Why is she a prostitute? It represents the fact that the northern king had prostituted themselves, worshipping another god, had been intimate with another god rather than the true god, had children, each of them indicating God was essentially done. But of course, he wasn't completely done because God says at the end you're coming back and that's Hosea too. Look at the contrast of the southern kingdom and uh, you know of of and what's happening here now. So what, what it's important to see what we have in view. And that is that if we look carefully, we can see that Isaiah seven is uh, discussing Isaiah seven and eight uh, is discussing a civil war, a civil war where two kingdoms come up against uh, the southern kingdom of Judah at that time. Ahaz, Ahaz is a very wicked king. Now, why was he wicked? That's a very important question. We, I don't think we have time for that. It's a very important question because Ahaz's father was the only Davidic king who never sinned. Ahaz's father was a man named Yotam, just never mm-hmm. sinned, ever. His grandfather was Uziyahu, who was a very righteous man, but at the end of his life he made a terrible mistake of bringing frankincense in the temple. He misappropriated a role. That's only for the priests to do, but his, his enormous reign, that's called the silver period of Jewish history. Mm-hmm. Ahaz emerges. He's from the Davidic dynasty, and he does not deserve to be saved. He, although he's surrounded by two kings who want to destroy him, they're angry at him for making an alliance with the Assyrian Empire. It, God, in a sense, is stuck. Sounds strange, but God had made a promise, a promise to King David. And that is, going back to Second Samuel seven twelve through 16, and that is that if your sons will sin, I will punish them with the rod of men. I will, however, never remove the kingdom from them as I did from your predecessor, Saul. So God has to save Ahaz, but Ahaz doesn't really, in a sense, really deserve it. For that reason, we're going to see that Ahaz sometimes is called the house of David, because it's because he is from the house of David, that's why he's being saved. Isaiah is going back and forth with Ahaz. Ahaz doesn't even want to sign Isaiah saying, 
I'm going to give you a sign anyway. This is so in contrast to a man like Gideon who's asking for signs. Correct. Notice that. It's very strange. Right. Hezekiah is looking for signs. Oh, it's counterintuitive. Rachel doesn't want to test the Lord. He's feigning piety. This conversation with Isaiah, we have an enormous amount of material describing this interaction. Um, right, and so and so I, I I didn't I know we didn't really want to go there today. We we're talking about the names, and so I think it's important because otherwise people will listen to this, and and people on the other side of the fence will say, well, they didn't want to deal with this issue because they don't really have an answer. But in the same way that we brought answers from uh, Sher Yeshuv and Meher Shalal Chashbaz, you know, from from the text and then showed what the sign was. Perhaps what you can do is at least um, touch on Isaiah 8.8 8 and 8.10 as it relates to Isaiah 7.14 and this whole idea of the third son of, uh, of Yeshiyahu. Well, you know, here, here we have not, well, let me just point this out. We don't necessarily have a third son. What, what when, what we what is coming into view here is that we have a child that's born. Mm -hmm. The success of Ahaz, who's going to be protected from his two kingdoms, is by a child who has two names. Right. One name is given by the father, and that name is saying, quicken, loot, hasten the booty. Oh, okay. And that Isaiah right. is told to give that child the name right. in Isaiah 8 verse 3. And the the woman... I should the have said woman, third name, not third son. <laughs> right, right, the third name, exactly. Right. So what we have here is a name, and all this is coming together. All these, these people, these children are not coming up again. Just like Hosea's children, a child like Lo Rachamu, Lo Ami, right. they're mm -hmm. not coming up in the Bible. That, that's not why they appear in the text. They're there as a signpost up ahead. So that's what's critical. That's what people get... It's that pronoun you have to watch out for. Now, Isaiah is intimate with his wife, which is, you know, the kind of thing we see in the way Moses is born. No virgin birth. Isaiah is intimate with his wife. He knows her. She conceives, and the child is born. And you, Isaiah, he's told directly, you give him the name. She's already told. She's a prophetess. We know that already. So, therefore, she's now able to give the name um, of Emmanuel, and now we have these chapters which describe this, and then we are something we're going to be doing on the tour. I believe I didn't. Look, I'm, we, I'm sure we'll be doing a lot of this. Is looking at these places where these events occurred in our upcoming right. tour at the end of the year. Right. Right. In the context of what what where, where we're at today. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we have Isaiah places this. These Isaiah seven and eight, it takes an enormous amount of, of ink to describe this civil war, which is strange. It's a very striking thing because if I asked most people, like, how was this resolved? We're told the sign is not the birth of the child. The sign is the maturity of the child. We're told that in two places. We're told that. In Isaiah seven fifteen and 16, before the child knows to reject bad, choose good, these two kings who, you will, uh, who are threatening you, they'll be gone. And we see the same thing again, that before the child knows to scream in verse 4 of Isaiah 8 of Isaiah, it says, before the child knows to say, Mommy, Daddy, um, Damascus, Samaria, Damascus is Syria, Samaria, well, that's the northern kingdom, they're going to be taken away by the king of Assyria, who is their staunch opponent. And Assyria ultimately is going to be destroyed as well. So we, we, we're, this is, a, this is a, in a lot of material devoted to a civil war, which ultimately is resolved where these two kings are assassinated. It begs a question of why that much material devoted, why, why do we have two chapters out of 66 devoted to this, in, to, in to reality, this event, to this narrative? Rabbi, in reality, uh, has this much material been exhausted in other texts about a single event? Only if they're, you know, monu only if they're monumental. You know, right. for and example, that's, that's um, what's coming up, um, that means if we, what's the next event that's going to come up is, is, was read in the Haftorah. 
Uh, and that's the event that will take place in the 14th year of, of Hezekiah. Ahaz is very wicked, and he has a son whose name is Hezekiah, Cheskio Amelech. And Isaiah, therefore, whose prophetic career spans a, a period of someone 80 years, just enormous amount of time, he's ultimately murdered by his grandson. So he sees the best of times. If we would if we would posit that David Solomon, that period, that 80-year reign as being the golden era of Jewish history, we would, we would then identify uh, Uziyahu Yotam as a silver period of Jewish history. And then we're, we're coming here to Ahaz. A man is a disaster. He's so wicked that he, he, he allies himself with Assyria. He sends his architects to see an, an Assyrian altar and rebuild it on the Temple Mount, to duplicate an Assyrian altar on the Temple Mount and shut the doors of the Temple. It's, it's something, he did what? He did what? That's right, he goes and he, 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 he the Assyrians had their own altar, which they brought their abominations on. He had, their, he had architects go look at it, write down all the details, and rebuild it on the Temple Mount itself. It's beyond belief how a man could be have a father and a grandfather so extraordinary, and he could fall. How did he fall? Why did he fall? Why would he have a name like Ahaz? What kind of weird name is that? That's all very intriguing. Why is he? Why is this civil war getting so much ink in the Jewish scriptures? This is now. Why am I asking these questions? Because you know, one of the things that the three of us have sought to convey to the listeners, to you, the listener, is that we're always looking for these anomalies, things that are strange, things that are, are very striking and odd. This is where the discovery is. This is something That's right. is where, the, where the explosion is. Right. It's so very is, explosive. So is this where Hiskiahu is introduced in Chapter 9? Yeah. So then what happens is, is that we, basically Isaiah is not really not interested in teaching history. Isaiah is so not interested in teaching history. We're not going to go into this now, but Isaiah, in fact, the first chapter chronologically of Isaiah is Isaiah chapter 6. We're not going to go into why 6 is not the first chapter of Isaiah. It's not going into it. At least Jeremiah and Ezekiel, do. first chapter is the first event. After that, they're all over the place. But Isaiah is going to slam together, to touch together two events and bring into view a second event in Jewish history, and it will be an event some 600 years after the Exodus, it is the greatest miracle that occurred to the Jewish people since the going out of Egypt. And it just, one just comes up and touches the other, as though nothing happened in between. So we're told about Ahaz, uh, that crisis, a lot of information is given about it, and suddenly there's another event that comes up in the next reign of Chizkiyo Melech, and incidentally, Isaiah, to show, to demonstrate that this is very, that, that, that means pressing, conflating these two events together is so important to Isaiah. So you know that we're not guessing. The event, the following event with Hezekiah is going to be described in much greater detail later on in Isaiah chapter 36 and 37. It'll also come up in 2 Kings 19 and so on. Sure. But it's going to come up later. The event occurs, Ahaz's son is a very righteous king, Hezekiah. And now Assyria, you know, it's like, it's like the Oslo Accords, mm -hmm. uh, where more Jews were murdered by the terrorists in the three years that followed the Oslo Accords than the 18 years that preceding it. So welcoming in Assyria, creating that alliance is going to produce enormous destruction, where Assyria is going to come, and going to just destroy the ten northern tribes. They're going to carry them away to a place unknown. It, so today, it sounds familiar. For the sake of peace, you sell your soul. Yeah, that means yeah. that always. That's a theme. It's going yeah. to come back and bite you. It means you you go and you're going to give away the land. You go and you think you're going to show. You think you're going to show how powerful you are. We're going to see that with Hezekiah at the very end of his career. He's going to show off the wealth that had accumulated to Babylonians, and he's told it's not a good thing. But, mm -hmm. but uh, right here, um, what happens is now uh, the Sancherev has come, has carried off the ten northern tribes. They've been carried off to a land unknown. He's, he's done that to many other nations. Bos Sancherev vilvul es kolo elam kulo. He homogenized nations. He knew that if you just conquer a nation and you let them stay, they're going to be patriotic. They're going to fight right. back. 
and he was smart enough to know you got to take them out and replace them with another group. He'd bring the Kutum and the Samaritans in. This is where the Samaritans enter the story. The Samaritans are brought in as the replacement population for them, and they're going to come up later up later on in Jewish history. And uh, and now, so many people think, well, that's where it stopped. Everything was great. One of the things I'm sure we're going to see in the tour is that, in fact, he's going to come down, he's going to destroy many great cities in Judah. We'll almost, we're going to see Lachish, which destroyed. We can see, it's not like we're going to look at a grassy knoll and say, ah, this is where it happened. We're going to see the battleground itself. That mm-hmm. is destroyed. So all the Judean cities are destroyed except for Jerusalem itself. And this is, here we enter into an extraordinary event in Jewish history, uh, never before since the Exodus. And the Jewish people are in enormous trouble now. The Assyrian army was now 185,000 people. The nation was trembling inside the old city of Jerusalem. One point we are going to show you on the tour, um, and I'll just say this to the listeners, when we talk about going on a tour, whether you're able to go on the tour with us or any time you go to Israel, let's say you're not able to, do not try to go to Israel without going on a tour that goes through the goes through because you, you'll miss everything. The old city of Jerusalem is not exactly positioned as it is today. It was much further south. We're going to see, very important, the wall, the actual wall of the first temple. It's goes, it cuts right through the Jewish quarter today. Uh, places like Damascus Gate, in the, what is called the old city, that was not part of the old city right. in, 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 in during the biblical time. Um, the Jewish people were in, in the old city. We're going to see on this tour the arrows, the Assyrian arrows, they've all been discovered in that, those stones. Uh, of, of, and the Jewish people are there and they're trembling. Tre- they're shaking. Uh, uh, Paul Johnson, a historian, a brilliant historian, writes that 185,000 soldiers in the ancient world, extrapolating that, would have been the equivalent today of more than 4 million soldiers. It's an unimaginable, it's more soldiers than the United States and coalition forces used to go into the fight Saddam Hussein. It's the, That's amazing. So they were, they were done. They were fried. And um, so Sancheirev sends his scribes, wicked people, who are screaming in, in, in Hebrew to the people inside the, the Jerusalem, which is completely walled in. There was no Jerusalem outside of the wall like today, they're all walled in and saying to them, you, you've seen what Sancher, what our king has done. Has any of the gods ever protected them? No, they haven't. Uh, surrender now. Surrender now. The most horrible things will happen to you. Give up Hezekiah now. So what comes into view is a second time when the, when the Davidic dynasty or the promise that God to made to King David is under direct threat. Hezekiah is to be surrendered uh, the people of uh, the Assyrian leadership, the scribes are screaming out. Let me make this very clear to you. You can see this very, just read Isaiah 36, where the, the people are trembling. They, they're, they're shaking when they're hearing the voice of the Assyrian scribes screaming out to them. Uh, you have no hope. Everyone else has been destroyed. And, you know, imagine being in Jerusalem and knowing that all the other uh, Judean cities have been destroyed. Everyone, uh, Lachish was enormous. It's, it's gone. Uh, everything in the north is gone. That's all that's left. This was a holocaust. Right. Th- that, you, that's it. That's all that's left. That's it. That's it. Now, what happens is uh, this is where everything... There are many of you listening to this show right now who, go, who say, I'm not sure I know how to pray. If you want to know how to pray, this is how you do it. So uh, the, 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 the scribes inside the old city, inside Jerusalem, the only city, I shouldn't use the word old city, inside Jerusalem, write down the message of the Assyrians, and they hand it over to Hezekiah. Mm-hmm. Everybody is sackcloth and ashes. It's, mm-hmm. And Hezekiah just takes these pages, and he just walks into the temple, and he throws them down and throws his face down to the ground. And it begins to tremble. And it, you see this prayer now emerging in verses, I believe it's, correct me if I'm wrong, 36, 37, excuse me, uh, 17, 18, and 19. And this uh, is the prayer what, of the nation. What, what, what the, essentially what is he speaking is on behalf of the nation? 
And he's Rabbi, saying, what, what chapter is that you're talking about? So we Isaiah 37, 37. Uh, okay. verses 7, 17, 18, 19, okay. and 20. Okay. And, and, Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, on behalf of the nation, says, not please save us. This is a very intriguing prayer. Said, that would be the intuitive thing. Oh, we're in so much trouble. God save us. Hezekiah is saying to God, is making a case to God and saying, look what's going to happen. What will the world say? Your name will be trodden down. If very God very much like Moshe's defense for the people of Israel at Sinai. Right. And, and, and you see, he says that truly, you know, the king of Assyria has laid to, wait all the, laid to waste all the, nat- all the other uh, nations in their land. Nothing, you know, they, they, now, Lord, please, he says, save it here because all the, all the kings of the earth will know this is the key point. This is the key point. At the end of verse 20, he says, so that the world will know that you, God, are the true Lord, that there is no one else but you. That mm-hmm. means what Hezekiah is saying is, on behalf of the people, is that please save, save this city. Why? So the whole world will know that you, Lord, are Lord, and there is no other. Amen. That's the case he makes. And this is the same thing that's going on today. Right. Um, th- it doesn't change. Uh, th- th- every one of Israel's enemies um, in the modern day only wants to destroy Israel for one reason and one reason alone, and that's to prove that God is not God. Exactly. That's, that's exactly the case. At and, that juncture, that fine juncture, that's when Isaiah goes, ah, oh, is that the case? Isaiah immediately turns to Hezekiah, and he says to him these words. He says to him, thus saith God, because you pray to me, against Sacherim, the king of Assyria. This is what Hashem is saying. It said, it will not happen. Assyria will be destroyed. Sancher himself, the head of Assyria, he's going to run back, and that's what will be killed. They will be destroyed because you prayed in this unique way. This is described in a number of places in the scripture. The, we are now at the first night of Passover. You could only imagine the mood of the people surrounded, hearing the clamor of the of the Assyrian soldiers as they went to sleep after eating matzo, and then waking up the next morning was something very odd. There was no <laughs> noise on the other side of the wall. They looked over the other side, and there it was: a hundred and eighty-five thousand soldiers, Assyrian soldiers, they had perished. They were lying there dead. What a marvelous event! So Hezekiah's role here is very unique in that he inspired the nation understood what the purpose was. Not do this for me because I just don't feel like dying. Do this so that your name would be raised up so the world would know that you are God. And as, as a result of that, we have a miracle that occurs. The, David, the end game is the same as Ahaz. That means that ultimately the Davidic dynasty is preserved. But it's preserved with an explosion, an event that doesn't, will not happen again in history until the Messianic age. And, and that and, is that because there was a repentance of an exquisite nature, pow, the whole thing unfolds in a way that, and that's why we see this term, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. You can only imagine that the nation having a teacher like Hezekiah, Hezekiah, that's what's going to happen in Isaiah chapter 9. Right. Behold, the child has been born to us. You know, it's, the son has been given to us. Uh, the government was put upon his shoulders. This is going to be very troubling to the church because they're going to, again, want to misappropriate this. The church will want to misappropriate this because they don't want this about Cheskiyahu. They want this about Jesus. So the verbs that you're hearing now, his, his, his name has been called, you know, number of names, the most famous of all is the mighty God. Cheskiyahu literally means the mighty God. They're going to, the church is going to take these verbs that are in the past tense. They're speaking about a king who already came and mm-hmm. transformed the nation, and therefore the salvation has come about. I'm going to read about it through chapter 9. They're going to put that into the future tense. So both, you know, we so always tell about something about our cousins, like the Arabs. They're very uh, interested in Jerusalem, and they're very interested in Hebron. They're not that interested in Eilat. Eilat's a very beautiful place, mm-hmm. but they kind of know where it's really holy. Right. The, they, they, they have a sense. They could sniff it out. They know what to go for. Now, now, with this in mind, we have 
the question is coming very intriguing. We have here two events. This is going to be now, as, as you both talked about, Isaiah 9 and 10 describe the uh, salvation of the Jewish people in the 14th year of Hezekiah when the when, when, when this Assyrian army is destroyed, uh, the, the Davidic dynasty is preserved, and then we have another event earlier in chapter 7 and 8, and there we have the Davidic dynasty too preserved, but in a way that's not quite as exquisite. Both of them are given about equal amount of literature describing mm -hmm. them. They're slammed against each other as though nothing ever happened in between. Isaiah is not interested in history. So the, so the question has to be asked, why? Yeah, the, the question let's, is, let's why? Let's go to that now. So that's, this comes into... Here we have the redemption of full force. Isaiah 59 is very, very delicious. And Isaiah 59 starts off, the prophets in general, like Isaiah chapter 1, start off by a tremendous rebuke, but then there's a kiss. It's a patch, like a little slap, and then a, a kiss on the forehead. It's Isaiah 59 is, is very much set up that way. When we come to Isaiah 59, another passage that Paul is going to misappropriate, and I, I know I bring that in, it's okay. We have in verse 20, we have there a redeemer will volition goel. A redeemer will come to Zion to those who return from transgression, says the Lord. Paul's going to change that completely because Paul can't have people re repenting. He's going to have the redeemer changing the people. We're not going to go there for right now. From that juncture, from Isaiah 59 to the end, and Isaiah 60, arise and shine for your light has come. Isaiah 60 is so delicious. Arise, shine, your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And then we have that whole chapter talking about the sons of them who despise you will come, will be a nursing maid, and so on. And if you go to the very end of Isaiah 60, Isaiah 60 is a hot, steaming, messianic chapter. Brilliant. So what we have is like the, the end of this brilliant movement just explodes before our eyes in Isaiah 60. I mean, this is... Like, you know, the sons of the foreigners will build your walls, the kings. Because it's about Gentiles. The end of days is about the Gentiles being redeemed. Remember this. The Messianic age, unlike the Exodus, is the nations will come to know about the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It really is about the Goyim, about the nations of the world. The Jews really facilitated ten Gentiles grabbing the shirt of a Jew. Look at the very end. This is, this is just... You just want to rub your fingers together. The very last words of Isaiah 60, verse uh, 60, the verse 22 ends with these words. As we're describing 60, I encourage you, you know, even though the three of us are sort of moving through this quickly, I hope that some of the things you hear will encourage you to say, let me read this. This is really quite beautiful. The last words is, oh, man, it's beautiful. is mm. Be'itoi Achishano, which means, in its time, I will hasten it. Even hmm. though it's the smallest and uh, the smallest of mighty nations, right? So we have we have this. That means even though this doesn't make sense, it can't be. It logically is not rational. It's a tiny nay. It's going to be, but the ito in its time, in its appointed time, I will hasten it. Which of course is it, it, it seemingly superficially contradictory. An appointed time means it's a set time. So it's a set time in, in, a, in an epoch in history, but hasten it means it can be pushed forward. It can be pushed forward. It can be pushed forward if you do something that will trigger it to be hastened. So we have that, that image. It can either way. And in fact, we, we have about 10 minutes, and I, right. I believe it's so important that you're able to... Uh, bring this down to a, a fine point that challenges the heart and soul of the the Jew as well as people in the nations who we understand that redemption is really about the nations being brought to the full knowledge of Hashem. Yeah. How does all of this point to the 21st century where we're at now and what we are seeing happening within the nations and Torah being revived in the nations. Yeah. So, uh, you know, tell me if I'm wrong. I, you know, when I look at the, what, if I, when I look at the, at the uh, landscape, what do we see? I, um, I, I'm observing uh, people, the nations moving in two op, very polar opposite directions. Absolutely. We see some of the nations just coming 
and wanting to cling to the Jews. Even people from India and from North Africa, they just China, awakening now. Of all things. This never happened in history. Never. It never, it, I mean, there were individual Gentiles who converted to Judaism or became B'nai. It happened. It just never happened in the tens and tens of thousands. It's the, and this is really a dumb time to be, have anything to do with the Jews, logically. <laughs> and I'm quoting Rabbi <laughs> Wolby of Torch here in Houston says that anybody that comes to me and wants to convert, I, I ask them to go get psychotherapy first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is after the Holocaust. This is, you know, this is a good time to stay as far away from you. Find out if a Jew is in the area. There should be like an app on your Android that identifies <laughs> where Jews live and like, Stay away from them because Jews are a lightning rod for hatred around the world. Uh, in the United Nations, the Holocaust, the worst crime in human history. Yet now every people are drawn to the Jew. They don't know why. People are drawn. I see a Jew and so on and so forth. So we're living, we can hear the, it's all, it's like Shabbos, like you get Shabbos morning, you wake up, you're in the bedroom, but you can smell the chalant. It's, it's just about ready. It's popping right now. Mm. Um, so, so here we are in this unique time and we're given, in fact, two images of how the Davidic dynasty can be preserved, which means how could that salvation unfold? Uh, Be'ito, which means in its time, what might happen is that the Jewish people don't really deserve it. It might be a situation like Achaz, meaning that the reason we're not given in between these two events is because they're not relevant. Isaiah is seeking to take two monumental events and put them side by side to show that these are two ways which the Davidic dynasty could be saved. Remember, the name Yeshayahu, the name of the prophet called, the prophet called Isaiah, Yeshayahu means literally the salvation of our God. So that means everything in there really is about the ultimate salvation. So we're first shown a picture, one image of how the Jews could be saved. The outcome is the same. The Davidic dynasty is, is preserved, but it does not happen with the great the awesome meaning that big splendor of the fireworks and, and so on that we will find in Hezekiah. The end game is the same in that the Davidic dynasty is preserved. The, Jude, uh, the kingdom of Judah is preserved. The promise that God made is preserved. So Be'ito comes first means in its time, which means the time has come and now the Jewish people are essentially forced to accept upon themselves uh, God's kingdom. But that will be a very different thing than if the event happened like Hezekiah, in the events that unfold later on with his son Hezekiah, the Jewish people repent. The Jewish people recognize that it's about God. We're not, God is not our waiter. And that's the mistake people have. If, if we're right. asking God for things, what's the difference between sitting in a restaurant saying, I want my steak medium rare with the potato on this? We're not asking God that what we're saying, what, what Hezekiah has laid before God on behalf of the nation is, that the world has to know that you are God. And therefore, if it's achishena, if it's hastened, which means it's because of your in, unique initiative, then there's this explosion of events that will occur. And that explosion of events we see there in Isaiah chapter 9 and 10. Now notice that once we're done with 7 and 8, one picture, uh, 9 and 10, picture 2, two portraits, what's Isaiah chapter 11 all about? The Messiah. Mm -hmm. Right. Bingo. Isaiah 11, verse 1, uh, uh, we have uh, the root coming out of the, uh, the root is Jesse. Mm -hmm. Two and three, very unusual, a description of the Mashiach himself. Very important, a person who's filled with the spirit of Hashem, who's humble, who doesn't judge people by the side of his eyes, and someone who's filled with the fear of Hashem. And Isaiah 11 is a monumental messianic chapter. So we have these two images of the messianic age, Either way, the end game is the same. It has to be. The score at the end is identical. The question is, how will it happen? That depends. But it has to happen because the promise has been made. So if you had a worldwide format that every Jew and every righteous uh, Gentile could hear what you had to say, what would you say that would help you feel to initiate this amazing, most beautiful event? You know, that's the, uh, you know, I think there, there are hairs in the air that are, that are sort of tickled when, uh, when sound moves past it, and that mm -hmm. and helps us hear. The tickling I get in my ear is I'm hearing, I'm not hearing people, thank God, speak about 
how fabulous the Israeli uh, pilots are. I'm not hearing, and maybe my world is different than the world that others are hearing. I'm hearing that Hashem is, is moving here. This is the hand of God. I'm Amen. hearing sounds like uh, Iris talked about with me, and that is that it would be inconceivable, I think. I, I can't say inconceivable. It would be very difficult for a person of faith to look on the, the events in the world around us and not conclude that uh, it's here. That means it's unfolding now before our eyes. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when we look at 11, you know, how often people, you know, don't continue reading in the rest of the chapter. They read the first couple of verses and they build their theology on the Mashiach based on that. Um, but it but it continues and goes on. It really gives us part of the job description that we know um, as Jews that that has to be fulfilled in order for somebody to be Messiah. There has to be um, this um, this return of the remnant, and not only a return of the remnant, but there has to be this um, uh, you know redemption of the other, of the people from the other parts. Um, I think in verse eleven it talks about that. Uh, starting in verse 10, it actually says in that day, um, the root of Jesse that has remained standing shall become a standard to the people. Nation shall seek his counsel and his abode shall be honored. And then it goes on in that day, my Lord will apply his hand again to redeeming the other part of his people from Assyria, mm. from Egypt, Pathros, Nubia, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, Amen. and the coastlands. He will hold up a signal to the nations and to assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. This mm. has to happen. And it didn't happen at a time when some people think there was a Messiah that came. Right. So, and it's, so, it's, it's, this is a critical word I want to mention here. In verse 11, we have, Yosef Hashem Shainis Yadoy, which means a second time. That means there, there is only one time. People are going, what second time? What, what are we talking about here? Well, wasn't it the Jews return already a second time when they returned from the Babylonian exile? It's not the case. When the, Jews, when the Jewish people were exiled after the destruction of the first temple, when destroyed by Babylon, very few Jews returned to the land of Israel. The vast majority right. were in Babylon. For the entire nation to return back to the land of Israel, we still await that moment. So this will be the second time when the entire nation, when the, as you said, Ira, where the Jews from all the world will return back to the land of Israel. No, as Isaiah 43 to north, don't hold back from the sons to the south, hold not back my daughters. And that's what we're coming now into full view, this full force of the redemption. Sure. This is not a partial return. That's when right now about 50% of known Jews are in the land of Israel. It should be said it's very likely there are maybe 50, 60 million Jews in the world. We just don't know. Elijah will, according to Jewish tradition, will identify who is a Jew because there are so many certainly who don't know that today. But the only a, certainly not all the Jews are in the land of Israel. That didn't, has not occurred since the, the first temple was destroyed. But what's going to happen is Shainus, which means just like the Jews were brought into the land of Israel, gathered and brought into the land of Israel when they, uh, in the first commonwealth, as they're coming uh, after the 40 as they enter the land of Israel, that of second time has not occurred yet. It certainly not only didn't occur during the Christian era, the Correct. opposite happened, of course, in the year 70. Any, any Jews that were in Israel were expelled by the Romans. Shane is here the second time is a complete return of the Jews to the land of Israel, to their homeland, that which was promised to their forefathers. Amen. And, and look, sorry. Ira, Ira, Go ahead. I, I, you know, I think that we need to run. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. This is going so well. Uh, no, 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 no. They're so cute. I love them. Go ahead. I want to spit. I'm so excited. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I think we should run this over a little bit of time because... No, I, I, the, I'll go until let, tomorrow morning. Yeah, I, I know, but... Uh, <laughs> Rabbi Singer, you know, when, when I look at, for example, in my local community, uh, the Jewish community, we have, you know, approximately 11,000 seats in shul. And there are approximately 60 to 80,000 Jewish people living in the city of Houston. Yeah. And even if everyone would become Jewish, and uh, go to observance at whatever level and start attending shul, there's not enough seats. At the yeah. same time, I'm looking at the work of some of these organizations called Torch, who is outreaching to uh, 
you know, the non-religious Jewish community do an amazing job, uh, orthodox sort of enticing of Jewish people to bring them back to some level of observance and also Chabad. Something is happening deep within the soul of the Jewish people, but it's not just the soul of the Jewish people. It is also within people of the nations in which I have a considerable amount of experience in. And I, I, something is happening that is very unique to our time. And if you could take a moment to appeal to the person that might be just on the edge, either a secular individual that's not been very religious uh, who is Jewish or a person within the nations to encourage them to to sort of inspire redemption to come to their lives and also to the nations. Christianity is called the church. Judaism has never been called the synagogue. The center right. of Jewish life, which means serving the God of Israel, has always been the Jewish home. The, the rabbi of that home has always been the mother. Um, bring it home. That means uh, one of the mistakes I think people can make is they think that you go to a place and that's where God is worshipped. It's home. God is, should be in every aspect of your life, in every place of your life. Uh, Hashem is there. You need to find Him in every aspect of your life, not not just in a synagogue to bring it home. Uh, that's where uh, Jewish life is. It's in the home. That is the that is the synagogue. So can you can you talk? Can, can for a moment you address the difference between tshuva for the Jew and tshuva for the non-Jew? Well, um, both of them in in either way is 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 a little complicated. But but in either in either case, what might get in the way is many people don't realize that it's so accessible that God all he wants to do is hear you. We find that at the end of Isaiah, it's not, my arm is not too short to save, it's not my ear, not big. It's, it's you're getting in the way. A classical, what Isaiah is going to convey throughout these splendid chapters is the nature of any relationship. If I love you and you like me, we have a like relationship. It always takes on the lesser of the two. God's love for us is absolutely infinite. And therefore, we'll always be the lesser of those two. And therefore, we ourselves will define that relationship. There are times where self-esteem will get in the way of return to God. We'll find that also here. And you find everything in Isaiah. He says, "Don't you know the person who says I'm cut off? I'm a eunuch. I have no place." No, you do have a place. There's nothing. I'm not. You're right. not tried up. Um, I'm a sinner. I can't help me. No, God will forgive all your sins. That's what Isaiah is. Isaiah is addressing a person saying, "My self-esteem is there. I just don't feel like a good person. I feel like God really is done Come with on. me. I believe That's in good. Him deep down. I just think He thinks I'm, I'm a pretty mass nasty person. He doesn't want to look at me. I hear that from Christians. Like God is so great, He can't look at us. So we need this mediator." And Isaiah, who was the greatest opponent of the church, although he would live 700 years earlier, Isaiah, mm. thank God, put these oracles in place so that no one would ever need an oracle. No one would ever need a, a, a mediator saying, no, just turn to Hashem. Hashem will forgive you because God's Amen. ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Isaiah 55. Read these chapters. You'll get swept away. Um, what, I, I probably ran out of time here. but Pretty amazing. Uh, well, no, no. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm willing to go over time, and the reason why is th there are so many individuals that are looking for the right uh, uh, impetus, the right uh, inspiration to make that step. And if they only realize that the the only thing between us and expediting the final redemption could be are returning back to authenticity and uh, trust in Hashem, and that there is only one God and there's only a Torah for all nations. Right. Um, I think that you know, you know, both of you, you know, Rod, you, you have, uh, you, 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 you understand the church. Ira, you understand the church very well. If I'm wrong, I've never been in the church, but I've studied it, and I think that. People who have left the church still bring with them the culture of Paul. 
Paul, and that's damaging, the culture, the culture right. of Galatians. What Paul conveys essentially is the following. To, to, after the year 50, almost everyone is converting to Christianity or non-Jews. And what Paul is trying to say is, don't worry, you're not a second-class citizen. He's going to be playing games with, with the book of Genesis and Galatians 3, and every, you're all okay. So now what happens is Paul is explaining why, even though one would think non-Jews are second-class citizens, I'm going to tell you why you're not because of Christianity. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that when people leave Christianity, they say, okay, it's all nonsense, but they think, but that part, there's still that, that, that relic of Christianity is, but we Gentiles, we don't, have, we don't have that connection as the Jew. The Jew is here to facilitate you, the, who is not, or at least you don't think you're a Jew, to get you closer to the God of Israel. Hashem loves you. The purpose of the Jew being chosen, chosen mm. means not chosen for wealth or, or, or security in our possessions, chosen to what? To be despised by the world and not to flinch, to be able to say to be a light to the nations. That term or lagoim is unique to the, uh, to the book of yeah. Isaiah. And that is to bring in the non-Jew, you, well, listen to the show, your mother, you don't believe is Jewish, to bring you to the God of Israel, to have a direct relationship with him based on scripture, not based on uh, where you came from, from as Ezra calls the filth of the nations. Sure, and it's like I always tell people, they need to understand, Rabbi, that um, there is no distinction. Um, God doesn't distinguish uh, between one neshama and another. Um, we only have different duties and responsibilities right. um, in the same way that you're a Kohen, okay, um, and I'm not. Um, but there's no distinction between us as Jews. You're no greater a Jew than I am, but you have greater responsibilities and duties as it relates to the temple when the temple is rebuilt than I would. Yeah, a little greater. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But, uh, yeah, again, but you know yes, what I'm saying. That's right. it's, what, what? It's, it's, it's obligations <laughs> and duties and responsibilities that separate us, not the fact that you're more elevated than I am as, as a Jew. Right. But what happens is, tragically, people, although they recognize at some stage that the, the tenets and creeds of Christianity aren't true, they bring with them the culture exactly. of, of Romans 11. Absol absolutely. And that, that's the right. damage. Yeah, one of the things that I, that I caution people all the time in having discussions with them often on Facebook, and I'm sure Rod does as well, and I'm sure you do, Rabbi, mm -hmm. is that that exactly, and I tell them, you can't come out now and have a relationship with Hashem the way you want to, carrying the baggage of Christianity with you. Mm -hmm. You can't look at, for instance, Torah Shabal Peh, you know, the oral Torah, and say, well, those are traditions of men, because that very language tells me that you're speaking from your past. You're speaking from that Christian culture that looks at the oral Torah as... Um, as uh, traditions of men, automatically. Right. Um, even, even though that's the case, you know, the Sermon on the Mount is unique to the book of Matthew. There is no mountain in Luke, you know, because Matthew wants to to present Jesus as a uber Moses, as super Moses, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So we don't, we, there's so many stories that are unique to Matthew because Matthew wants Jesus to be the ultimate super, super Moses. There is no Sermon on the Mount. We are going, really? There's no mountain in Luke? I'm going to look. No, it's a valley, no mountain. But <laughs> it, it isn't because they want him to be able to, they're going down to Egypt. That's unique to Matthew. You won't find that in Luke. The whole thing just to have it very Moses-like. So but what, what we're introducing is a lot of this extra biblical concept. Well, you have heard, but I say unto you. What, well, what is that? That's some sort of new idea, which has done so much damage. Like you've heard that if you, you know, committed, you know, committed adultery, you know, that, that's the sin. But I, if even you thought about it, then you've already done it. Well, then you're you're nailed. In classic, classical Jewish thought, the classical Isaiah theology. If you think about committing adultery, but you say, no, Hashem commanded me not to, and therefore I will not, you're even greater than the person who never even thought about it, who right. spent his entire life married to a woman living right. on a deserted island where he never saw another woman in his life. Exactly. Who was greater? the direct opposite. Right. Right. You see how delicious that is? How, pff, wow. Do you understand? <laughs> That's just so, the opposite. It's the person who's tempted and resists that temptation. That's the Abraham. That's the Daniel. It's the person it, it, who was able to be tempted but would stand the temptation. That's what makes you great. Yeah. Now, the reason Christianity wants to convict you. Why? Because they have to introduce, they have to infuse a reason. Why do we need this fifth wheel? Ah, this is the reason. Because even if you're tempted, you did, aha, we got you. Then you need it. So that, of course, everyone's tempted. So if people could understand that redemption that is coming in the Messianic era is going to be redemption of all 
nations. It's right. not to a select group. It's not to a narrow group. It's to all who will come and trust in Hashem. Mm. Right, the one true God that his Kiyah. That's it. Yeah. That's it, right. Yeah. And so one could even argue, this is very counterintuitive, but I, one could even po posit that the Jews are facilitators. That means the whole Messianic age really is there for the Gentiles. And the, we're simply facilitating it for them. Do you understand how, how counterintuitive this is? But a straight text. The function of a Jew, if we're God's firstborn, Exodus 4.22, four, uh, right, and so on, and many other texts. What does that mean, firstborn? We're not the oldest nation, oldest, chronologically. That means the oldest child, what does he do for the young, younger children? The younger children learn how to interact with daddy better by seeing as an example the oldest child. If our role is to facilitate, we're facilitators. Do you understand how different this is? The, we, the role of the Jew is to facilitate, to be an or the light, for the Gentiles. I didn't say this. Isaiah says this. This is what the prophet says. This is, this is, there's nothing coming from Ira. There's nothing here coming from Rufi. Nothing coming from me. This is what the text no, says. We're absolutely. just simply facilitating this. When people say we're chosen, no one stops saying chosen for what? We're chosen to facilitate the redemption of the nations of the world. Right. If there's any encouragement to the Jewish community is that you are responsible to facilitate the redemption of all mankind. And to the people of the nations, if they could only understand that even Isaiah that speaks so eloquently about the, uh, the, the, even the, uh, the Hanukkah, the, uh, the, uh, the idolater that becomes Shomer Shavas, that, that becomes, that, that draws his soul near to the mitzvah of Hashem will be given a place in the temple to give sacrifice. To me, mm. that absolutely blows my mind. Yeah. Oh, one other footnote here that I think the listeners will be like sort of blown out the window on. I was. This, what we went through now, this extraordinary journey through the sacred text, helps us understand something that also was very odd. We know there are two people in history that knew when the Messianic age would occur, Jacob and Daniel. And when they begin to reveal it, it's very traumatic for both of them. That means when it comes into view for both of them, in Daniel, it's very obvious. It's very, Daniel is very troubled by it. Why is he troubled? Now, well, the answer, now we understand why Dan, this is such a traumatic moment. You see, what did Daniel see? He knew what? Did he know the time when it's appointed time when the Jews would, the last possible moment the Jews would be redeemed? Or did he know when the hastening would happen? Obviously, he couldn't know when the hastening would occur. The moment Daniel knew about was the appointed time. That's what he's viewing. What is that? That's a disaster. That's not a good thing. It means he's looking at when basically the Jews have dropped the ball every time when God has to force the Jews into a state of repentance. That's what Jacob has in view as well. And therefore, both of them are viewing the beito. They're not looking at the achishan. They're looking at the at its time, not in the hastening. They're looking at the achaz event, not the hezekiah event. They're right. traumatized by it. Now you understand why they both are looking at this and going, oh, this is very problematic. There's trauma associated with this. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah, wow. The, <laughs> wow. The, for me, yeah. for me the, the final wow and what Rod was talking about and kind of tying the whole thing together, you know, at least uh, as it relates to where we started at, you know, one of the verses at the beginning of the text we were looking at talked about, you know, Ephraim, when you, when you brought that up, Rabbi, about Ephraim joining in, you know, with the enemies of the enemies of Judah, mm. you know, to come against her. And it talks about Ephraim vexing Judah. Mm. Um, when we looked at Isaiah chapter 11 and I talked about the 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 um, the job description of Mashiach um, and this idea of the Messianic age and redemption coming in. I love verse 13 because mm, it yes. says at that time, then Ephraim's envy shall cease and Judah's harassment shall end. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. And Understand. that is a perfect picture of Ezekiel 37 that you talked about when it talks about the two sticks coming <laughs> together <laughs> in the Messianic redemption. Right. right. That's, that means it all comes together. So you see there 
means this is the nature just because obviously what Ira and, and Ruvain and myself want you to do any of these shows is not simply say okay this is the show now we've learned it what we hope to do is to excite your mind your soul to devote yourself to study these texts one of the things you'll notice is that this is the nature the texture of how that means Hashem with the care of care but there's like a little potch it's either the word means a little smack Isaiah 1 certainly gives us you know wake up and then there's a very tender kiss great love that's what we're going to find that means you know you have to wake up and then the kiss that's going to come together that's mm-hmm. the kiss that's going to ultimately come together the nation's going to come together and we see that today we see the nations called out whether it's in north africa the ethiopian jews jews from from india which we see Nigeria. now in the thousands yeah. all over the land of israel mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. amazing well I, I i mean this was just too much today guys it, it really yeah. was. It was just too much. Let me tell you why this seems to be so big for an uh, hour and, what, 15 minutes. Is we are living in the mm. age in which these l- l- deeper levels of the prophets are being unfolded. And we see it before our very eyes. And we are so grateful for Rabbi singer to be with us to expound on these things we we are ira and i are both seeing this on on the level that we are teaching and um for you to bring about a a true understanding of how these ancient texts are still very relevant to this very modern age is astounding and so exciting that I'm not sure that I'll be able to sleep tonight, to be honest with you. Yeah. I, 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 I think I'm speaking for the three of us. You know, whenever we're done with these shows, and we're probably concluding soon, I have goosebumps all over. I definitely have to change my shirt. You know, because what you said is very much the case. Can you see, and I'm speaking to you right now, who are listening to the show, can you see how these sacred texts, these towering texts, are as, at least as meaningful for us today as they were to those who heard it for yes. the first time as they were preached in the city of yes. Jerusalem. Do you yeah, understand? Yeah. That's how exquisite this Amazing. is. Amazing. I want to yeah. leave. I want to leave our listeners, especially our listeners that are from the nations. I, I want you to walk away from this today, <laughs> recognizing the level that you have been elevated to by having left idolatry. That this right. is such a significant time in the earth as it relates to these texts that we're talking about. And, and Rod mentioned this just a few minutes ago. He <clears throat> talked about your ability to hasten this redemption. Oh, you sure. are part of an amazing thing that's happening. And rather than seeing yourself, because we see this all the time, that people somehow think that you're not connected, that somehow you think that you're a second-class citizen. It's just the opposite, my friends. You have been brought for such a time as this and have been elevated, elevated spiritually to help usher in this messianic redemption that we're talking about in these times. Amen. Amen. And um, I thank you, Hashem. You are Lord. You are Master. Amen. To, your, to only all, na- all nations, may we merit to, that every nation, we should see witness every nation, that every knee will bow to you, every tongue will praise you alone, every... Only your name will be raised up above every Amen. other name in the world. And may it be that uh, a prayer in our study of, of your sacred prophets, may it be that we'll hasten the redemption. Hasten. Now Amen. you understand how important that hasten is. We'll bring, we should witness it uh, quickly in our time. And may the nations of the world witness this and repent and Israel return together. And Amen. may we rejoice in Jerusalem. And therefore, out of Zion will come forth the Torah. Amen. And the word of the Lord from Yerushalayim. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, I, there's just nothing more that we yeah. can say. I'll just say one no, thing. Today. I will say, it. When, when we are in the old city in October, we're going to see the wall. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say it to you because the wall is there, the Assyrian wall. They have found the, the, the arrows in that wall. We're going to see the actual wall yes. of that period. This is not like we're looking at a grass thing. We're going to see it there. It cuts right through the Jewish, the Jewish quarter is is the part of what is called the Jewish quarter, that is the part that has always been a part of the of Yerushalayim, always and was. It, and it points to today. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so with, with that, I mean, I, I don't want, 
certainly don't want to do a, a commercial today about this. But, you know, we, we think that part of our responsibility and the reason why we wanted to do this tour was to make this real on the ground for people that are able to go. That right. the things we talk about on the show would become a reality and it would change your lives completely. So, you know, we are going to Israel October 19th to the 30th. You know, it'll be myself and Rod and Rabbi Singer and um, what we're calling the Let's Get Biblical Tour. All you need to do is uh, go to either my website, TorahThreads.com, um, or, or um, Rod's website, Nativ.net, um, or you can go to the tour company's website, IsraelTours.com, slash GetBiblical.html, and I'll, I'll put that up on Facebook for anybody that's interested um, if you want to come along with us. We're very excited about this. And we're very excited about those people that are going to be able to come with us and experience this firsthand, these soaring texts in oh, the man. very places that um, that the texts are speaking of. So so stick around um, week by week um, as uh, we continue to go through these amazing texts. Thank you so oh, much man. for listening and Shavuot Tov. Mm-hmm.